I wish it was all true. Um, no, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, as Tim said, we've collaborated for, for a long time and I really enjoy uh, working with Tim and visiting Berlin, actually. Um, I've been really fortunate to be able to work, work um, collaboratively with Tim and had quite a number of projects that have involved the Berlin comparative dimension to them. Um, also, congratulations to the students. Um, use your travel funds really, really well. Um, there's some great cities you could do work in with those funds. Um, but you mustn't spend them on alcohol or enjoying yourself too much. Um, uh, what, I wanted to, what I want to talk about tonight is um, I'm, I'm going to try and talk about um, some work that's already been undertaken and to try to think about the consequences and implications of it. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's part of a bigger project. Ooh. We'll press the right key. There, there we go. Um, it's part of a bigger project that um, I'm undertaking with a colleague, Andreas Luke Ayala. It's a sort of book project that we've been doing, really trying to excavate some of the um, partly the hidden history of smart cities, but looking at the application of computational systems, digital smart technologies in a range of cities uh, around the world. And we stitched together a, a variety of different funding to be able to do a series of uh, site visits and case studies, looking at different dimensions of uh, the application of computational logics to um, urban, urban contexts. And I want to choose one dimension uh, of the work that we undertook. We did a uh, quite, quite in-depth piece of work around Rio de Janeiro. There's a city that I can really recommend visiting. There's a particular control room been developed in Rio de Janeiro that I want to talk about as an exemplar of what I think might be an attempt to constitute a new logic of, of a form of atmospheric control. Now, the interesting thing about these different sorts of applications, predictive analytics, sensing, smart city standards, and these control systems that all make up the, the broader ecosystem of smart cities, is they have... Um, now, you know, I can't remember which key I pressed. Here we go. They have a, these are technologies. They're technological systems that have um, been transferred, transmuted from corporate and sometimes military context into an urban context. And this is a quote from IBM who make a particular sort of smart city product called an urban operating system. And they talk in this uh, example about the way in which the city doesn't have a central point of coordination in which different forms of data can be brought together. The way in which the, the, the management of the city is domain specific and fragmented. And they talk about the application of their software, the integrated operating center that addresses these challenges of how you connect the disconnected. And these oversight capabilities that these software systems uh, uh, provide can be applied to any city or enterprise. And that tells you something about the logics that are being applied to urban infrastructure systems. These are systems that are being transferred from a corporate uh, mode of integration. These are complex information packages that are being transferred from the corporate sector into the urban sector, which, which was quite important in understanding the logic of control that they produce. So I want to talk about Rio de Janeiro's center of operations. Have any of you heard of this at all? A few little nods. Um, it's it's a really unusual, if you want to find uh, the smart city, you wouldn't look for it in Europe or the US, you would actually probably go and have a look at this system uh, in Rio de Janeiro. It's a, it's a really quite sophisticated system for controlling infrastructure systems um, under, under, under uncertain ecological conditions in Rio de Janeiro. Normally control rooms are closed. This control room is very, very open. And it's always operating at the boundary between the exceptional, the emergency, and the normal. Now, it's often used as an international exemplar. Um, uh, IBM use it quite a lot in their promotional materials, even though a lot of the software that the system uses is actually developed in Brazil. 
but there's been quite limited empirical research on this control room. Now, it's often re represented as an exemplar, but it's not often very well understood in terms of what it's con what, what's distinctive about it and what its consequences are, or what its wider consequences might be, because it's being claimed that this can provide a model for how we control cities and their relationship with an un unstable ecology in the future. And this is what I want to talk about in this talk. So if we understand the problem of the city as about a problematic of how we maintain the circulation of good, goods, services, people, um, the materiality, the infrastructure systems that constitute the city became a, a particular form of, of, of government through and by technology. Infrastructure systems condition the degree to which we uh, consume resources, the way in which we use infrastructures and the way in which we interact. And the Rio core in a sense, tries to develop a new logic of operational control through the way it creates a particular sort of control logic that's new and distinctive. It's a little bit like the control logic. You can see on, the, on your uh, right there an image of NASA's mission control room. Some of the software systems in the Rio, in the Rio um, control room and the practices that they use in terms of how uh, the system works are actually derived from that NASA control room. So we need to understand something about well, conventionally what the control rooms do. I haven't really done very much work on control rooms. Most urban infrastructure uh, analysts and researchers, um, the control rooms that coordinate uh, infrastructure systems are curiously absent from that literature. There's a little bit about uh, the work process and labour process in control rooms, but there's not very much uh, re urban research literature about the history or utilisation of the control room. Control rooms are often secure private spaces. They're difficult to get access to because of the security implications. But they're involved in continuous work in preventing breakdowns in infrastructures, responding to disruption and overcoming interruption. Lots of work gets undertaken in a control room, in the electricity, transportation, water control rooms that all exist in, in Berlin and other major cities in maintaining a, a, a reliable and steady supply of service or resources. And from inside a control room, an infrastructure is not particularly visible or stable. You interact with the infrastructure through signals, telephone calls, uh, digital messages and software systems. And if you're inside a control room, it's always, the system's always at the point of breakdown. You're always managing the system and trying to avoid a breakdown. Now, it's, this notion of black boxing is quite important in the sense that these, these, these control rooms are often hidden. They're often um, they're not accessible. But so are the infrastructure networks that these control rooms uh, enab en uh, enable the functioning of. Infrastructure networks are often um, invisible. We don't see them. They're hidden under the ground. They're, they're st we only see them when they become unstable, when the, when the, uh, the road network becomes congested, when elect electricity systems um, are disrupted by weather, um, or technological failures. So most of the time, control, net, control rooms and infrastructures are black box. And I'm quite interested in what happens when that control room becomes opened and configured as a municipal capacity. Now, in understanding uh, the, the reason why Rio developed this sophisticated control room, it's a very particular urban context. Uh, highly uneven distribution of services, critical sorts of issues around uh, personal and other forms of security. And there's been a continual search for finding ways of managing what's a very unstable and difficult urban context. And there was a set of issues in the run-up to the World Cup and the Olympic Games that brought these issues to a head. Particularly in April 2010, there was a really serious flooding event um, in which many lives were lost. And that created a context and a debate about trying to develop a different logic and a different system for trying to maintain and stabilise control of the city and the city's infrastructure. There's other sorts of control rooms that deal with security and policing that are outside the remit 
of this talk. I want to focus on the municipal, municipal control centre. This is an image from the control centre. It looks very similar to the, to the NASA system. Um, it's, it's designed as an, operating, as an operations centre and in the sense that it, it, brings, it, it deals with the everyday monitoring of infrastructures, municipal services, transportation, but also acts as an emergency response centre. And it, it's, it's really quite significant. It's an actual major, it's a major social achievement. They brought together multiple municipal services within this one control room, which represents 32 different municipal bodies and 12 private concessions that provide other sorts of infrastructure services. So it, it, it doesn't displace the need for the separate control rooms of all the other um, infrastructure providers, but it brings together those elements of those control rooms that monitor the everyday operations of the system and deal with emergency responses. And it utilizes video cameras, mapping platforms to visualize resources and disruptive events in real time. It's really absolutely remarkable what the um, Brazilian municipality have achieved with this. And just to give you a flavor, because I realize I'm talking, uh, talking about this um, without you being able to see inside it. I've spent quite a bit of time in this control room. I want to show you a very short video that, which thanks to Olaf we've been able to, to arrange, just to give you a flavour for the claims that are being made and what this system looks like. As our world becomes increasingly complex, rapidly growing cities face unprecedented new challenges. Rio de Janeiro, while known for its rich culture, active lifestyles and stunning natural beauty, is also burdened with crime, aging infrastructure, and natural disasters. Already a burgeoning city of 6 million, Rio now prepares for millions more as they get ready to host the 2014 World Cup and the 2016 Olympics. Like other forward-thinking cities, Rio realized it was in need of a new city operations plan to improve emergency response coordination, manage increased traffic, and improve services for citizens. Rio turned to IBM to create a smarter city by integrating more than 30 agencies into one centralized command center. The new smarter city system gathers data from sectors across city operations, making it easy for security officials and crisis managers to monitor and respond to problems quickly. Data from sensors and video feeds create real-time maps and graphs, working to predict problems and counteract them. Weather monitoring systems forecast heavy rains with state-of-the-art accuracy, giving city officials the ability to anticipate floods and mudslides, alert the public, and send emergency support. The Smarter City system has improved emergency response time by 30%, making Rio a safer city. The result is a visionary city, equipped to react, predict, and plan for current and future events. But this is just the beginning. Rio's Smarter City transformation is set to expand to transportation, public works, and utilities. Every city, large or small, has its own unique challenges. Working with forward-thinking cities like Rio and more than 2,000 other Smarter Cities projects around the world, IBM is able to help make cities smarter. Uh, as I said, that's a piece of IBM publicity, and actually IBM software is less central and critical to the Rio core than that, that, that video would um, suggest. Now, what was, but it gives you a flavor of some of the claims that are being made about this system. And what was really interesting, the, the, the origin of this computational complex system was a request from the mayor of Rio de Janeiro in 2010. Um, to, to the city officers and it was a request not only to monitor rain but to foresee it and at that stage the city didn't have any me meteorologists people wanted to know if it is going to rain in a specific spot of the city at a specific time and this is very difficult so as part of the investment in the um, control room they actually the city Initially, it borrowed a radar from the Brazilian military, but it eventually bought its own municipal 
weather radar system. It's quite a sophisticated system. Uh, and this radar system enables them to develop a very accurate short-term predictive analytical capacity to understand where it's going to rain and when it's going to rain in the city. And this is quite critical to understanding the logic of these operational, this operational system. It's based on a it's based on a, a, a set of techniques called now casting. And now casting uh, are techniques that developed within the uh, economics sector to deal with very short talks for forecasting of, pri of economic prices. So it's a combination of now and forecast. And these techniques are now being used in uh, finance, meteorology, and social media analysis. And, in the, and what it tries to do is develop new knowledge and capacities uh, to monitor key aspects of the sort of urban atmospheric environment, weather, rain, uh, also has been extended into air quality, storm water, and other sorts of ecological uh, dimensions of urban life. And they're now being explicitly marketed at urban contexts. So you can find applications in Delhi, in the Midwest, Canada, around a whole range, uh, in China as well, around a whole, whole range of ecological threats to cities. And they're mobilized to deal with the sort of uh, the future potential of increased frequency and uncertainty of climatic events. So these digital systems are seen as critical to how cities manage these events. And there's an image there of the new radar that Rio de Janeiro built. And they established, along with the control room, their own uh, meteorological prediction systems that are linked very carefully to the, the way the center of operations works. And it's quite a remarkable capacity. They can, they can use the radar system to target individual clouds and to follow those um, as they approach Rio um, off the ocean. And they, they utilize a whole range of digital systems, lightning monitoring, all sorts of predictive anal analytics, because they're really interested in where this rain's going to fall. They don't just want to know it's going to rain in Rio. Rio's built on a series of really high... Uh, uh, there's a really series of ravines and really high hills. So when it rains, you have these really serious problems of landslip and deaths, particularly in low-income areas. And it's really, really threatening and really disruptive. So what they're trying to understand here is in a really uh, spatially focused way where there's going to be particular sorts of problems associated with rainfall. And they've developed a capacity to deal with these issues through the control room. So this is a, an example of um, a, a journalist speaking from the control room. The control room is open. They let researchers in. There's a, a, a set of journalists who are based permanently in the control room. You can go and watch from a viewing area what's going on in this control room. Um, the journalists are given access to all the information and can see what's happening. They can stand in the viewing area as well. And every day, journalists report from the control room. And this is an example of a, 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 a news story about an impending storm that's approaching Rio. And if you watch, Rio, if you watch television in Rio, you'll see when there's a potential weather event, the control room becomes a really key focus for trying to understand the potential issues associated with a particular weather event. Um, the, also, and part of that, there's also um, quite sophisticated social media applications to try to inform local residents about particular sorts of weather events. And they've developed a system where uh, messages can be, where they've got a degree of certainty about where the actual event's going to take place, they can utilise social media, they can mobilise municipal workers to actually prepare or move local populations to clean out drainage ditches, um, to actually prepare a proactive response to the, infra to the potential threat of these events. Now I think there's something really interesting about the logic of these systems because this is an attempt, in a sense, traditionally, um, 
the logic of control, I suppose, was around preparedness for, for these sorts of events. This is a, an attempt to try to constitute a response that says, well, we don't have to close the whole city because we think there's going to be a dangerous weather event. We might have to close down parts of a city. We might have to focus activity around preparing populations in parts of a city while we can maintain the operational efficiency of the wider city. This is quite a different logic of, of control. And in that sense, um, it's significantly different to how, we've, how we think about uh, managing these events. Crowdsourced information is also an important tool for the operation of the um, control room. So they utilize VASI and other apps to feed information back from uh, local car users into the control room system. So it actually has a degree of openness uh, in terms of how it utilizes information from uh, residents. Now, the question then is, what, 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 what's the implications of this form of, of, of network control? In some senses, it's sort of a partial and reselective rebundling of infrastructure. It tries to bring together those aspects of infrastructure that are concerned with operation and emergency response together. It doesn't try to integrate all functions of an infrastructure in a single control room. It tries to bundle together particular sorts, of those particular aspects that are concerned with the maintenance of circulation and the maintenance of everyday life. The control room becomes an important way of seeing the city. The control room is not hidden. The control room is very open. The control room actually produces and communicates knowledge about the city through, through the utilization of social media and through the way it engages uh, television stations and radio as well. And it brings together questions around the sort of everyday and emer emergency modes of management. It's always trying to understand the boundary between normality and emergency and, and try to manage and constitute that boundary um, actively. It is a very particular logic of control that you can find two sources for. It brings together, I think, uh, two, two logics. It brings together a, the sort of operational, logistical logic of, a, of an aviation control room, like the KLM Operations Center there, where it's very much concerned with real-time and efficient circulatory control of aircraft, or a spacecraft in the case of the NASA control room under potential conditions of disruption. But here it brings together those questions within an urban context. So it's very much interested in, I suppose, a nodal logic of control, the sorts of control system that you would find in a sports stadium, shopping centre or office complex, a more territorial form of control. These logics of logistical and territorial control start to become bundled together in the urban context to deal with a set of ecological questions. And the director of the Corps, very interesting in interviewing the director and talking about the sorts of expertise that they require in the control room, stresses that the coordinators have corporate backgrounds, um, private sector experience with logistical operations, control and dispatch. They come from the private sector Air, operating airports and aviation companies. They're now operating cities. So there's a very interesting set of interconnections that are taking place here. So the, the core becomes a significant way of trying to understand the way in which infrastructure is understood within the city's collective imagination. The precariousness and instability of infrastructure becomes visible to the public. It becomes a producer and communicator of knowledge about the city and when to take action, when to try to avoid the impacts, when to move from your home to a safe area. And it governs through the visual domains. It's about making infrastructure visible. It's utilizing crowdsourcing and social media, multiplying the eyes in the street and developing a more distributed perception system within the city. The core is the eyes of the population. For everything that happens here, we must give the best possible response. Um, and rather than utilizing cameras, they can utilize uh, intelli intelligence and data from individual citizens. But there's a degree to which this sort of sense of institutionalization of emergency has a sort of very particular focus to it. 
the, the director of the Corps was quoted as saying, we don't want him to get into issues of the demonstrations, whether they're right, as, right or, or wrong. For us, it's about the rest of the city, being able to maintain the routines. We communicate the situation to citizens and keep the city flowing. You can see the way in which this is really an emphasis on trying to maintain operational efficiency. Now, what I want to suggest about trying to widen this is why is this significant? Why does this matter? It's a, it's a major, uh, it's an incredible system. I don't think it's really given the recognition that it necessarily de deserves. Um, it's actually very much been put together with Brazilian exp expertise. But what's significant about it is, I think, is that if you think about the way in which this is, this, this is designed to respond to climate-induced turbulence, um, this is, a, this is a strategy that no longer focuses on infrastructure itself. It utilizes a combination of digital uh, technologies, computational data analytics, to bring together a, a mechanism to try to, to try to anticipate and, and to some extent control the uncertainties created by a more turbulent urban uh, context. So it's actually quite a it's, it's a it's a way in which you can see the the, 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 the the digital and the ecological start to come together into some quite interesting ways. And a sort of broader question that this um, leads to is this a different way of dealing with ecological uncertainty? Is this actually rather than saying the role of cities is to try to contribute collectively? to reducing carbon emissions or trying to live within limits. Is this, a con is this a sort of response that says, well, actually, we're going to live in a world of ecological turbulence. So what we need to do to gain competitive advantage is to see this as an opportunity. We need to use technologies and digital systems to try to gain some sort of competitive advantage in how we might be able to deal with this more turbulent future. So is this a, a way in which you start to say, well, we can develop a new logic of, of circulatory control in an urban context, rather than seeing the weather as being something that's unmanageable, can we render it, in a sense, manageable through these sorts of systems, through the ability to predict when and where you might have a particular sort of problem? Does that mean that you're able then to live within a great, greater degrees of turbulence? Does it become a computational logic of urban control. And so by way of starting to think about a conclusion then, if we think of the conventional way in which we think of infrastructure security, the main logic is preparedness. Um, the, lo the logic of trying to anticipate use of scenarios, what might happen in an infrastructural crisis, and to use scenarios and simulations as an attempt to prepare for that. And I think the question that we're now starting to ask ourselves, well, in the early 21st century, is this rather than a form of preparedness, is this an argument that you're not only prepared, but that actually you can maintain everyday urban life during a, 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 a particularly ecological event? Can you render the turbulence more manageable? Uh, can, you, can you use computational systems to, en to enhance your ability to be able to ensure your continued urban reproduction in a more uncertain future. So just by way of a conclusion and some questions I think this raises is that, so now casting the sort of techniques that are associated with this computational logic are being applied uh, around other sorts of um, uh, uh, urban ecological issues, um, air, air quality, um, stormwater flooding, uh, weather, um, there's a sort of extension of this logic, the, the uh, stability of electricity systems as well under certain weather conditions. So I think, the, so it appears to be an emerging logic um, of, of, of urban governing that enables continued urban circulation under conditions of, of, of turbulence. So is this an extension of preparedness or is it, some, is it perhaps a novel preemptive logic? So the logic claims that infrastructure could be managed and maintained even under conditions of turbulence without large-scale closure. So you don't want a situation like you had in New York when there was the heavy snow, when this, the whole city and all the airports were closed. You want something that might be able to limit the amount of time that's closure or close particular areas as and when you need to. And what forms of control and risk logics are at play with this emergent form of infrastructure control? Can it 
do what the proponents of it claim it can do. And I think under the logic of now casting, does the city, the city starts to appear as a sort of logistical entity. You can start to see the coming together of the systems that control spaceships and aircraft uh, and territorial control are being brought together to try to ensure the more effective maintenance of circulation within an urban context. And is this sort of collapse between the everyday of the normal and the emergency, is it a prerequisite for the permanent mobilisation of the present as a form of security, this notion of the real-time control of turbulence? Thanks very much. Thank you.